And I wanted to, I, I reached out to Ami um, because I've been a fan of what the, the William Grant Still Art Center has been doing for a long time. I've been to a, a, a few diverse uh, presentations, whether it's been local artists or uh, one time I was there when they were celebrating the life of Max Roach. And there was a, a performance of um, a group based on Max Roach's all percussion ensemble called M Boom. And um, if you haven't heard the original uh, group that he did, or, or if you weren't able to go to this um, concert, um, it's a lot more diverse and a lot more musical than you would think with having just percussion instruments. Um, and, uh, you know, they, we, they've had um, exhibits by local artists. We, they've had people come in that um, from the Mardi Gras Indian tradition uh, and present uh, to the community. So um, they've been doing a lot of really great work with, uh, with culture in that part of LA for a long time. So um, uh, I'm, I'm really happy that we could do um, this introduction maybe for a lot of you. So um, Abby, if you wanna uh, take it away and if everybody else can go on mute, that would be wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. Yeah, the, the, so that exhibition, the Max Roach exhibition, is part of our annual African-American uh, composer series. And I actually have to step in and say it wasn't just Max Roach. It was Max Roach and Abby Lincoln. Um, Abby Lincoln, not to be forgotten. And um, her family was really instrumental in that exhibition, too, and has worked with us um, on other, other things <laughs> throughout the years. Really, really amazing family. But uh, what we do at the William Grant Still Art Center is we have um, exhibitions and programs, three exhibitions a year. We generally have an education program. I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that, which is um, maybe a, a bit sad, but um, we have education programs. We offer uh, workshops. We offer, you know, the speaking series concerts. We do what we can with very, very little. As I stated, the uh, Art Center was slated to be closed by the Department of Cultural Affairs and City of Los Angeles in 2010. They wanted to partner it out and, um, and uh, the people of the city really spoke out. We, we um, had a, a town hall that held uh, hundreds of people inside. It was jam-packed way before COVID. <laughs> so that was when we used to actually uh, jam-pack indoors. And um, and the speaker, uh, the people really spoke out on behalf of the center. And so um, part of what I've been doing for the years is just making sure I root the center in some way so that, you know, this idea of, uh, of shutting it down won't happen again because it's, it's constantly been in, in threat of closure throughout the years. Um, our three exhibitions, we have an exhibition in the fall that's generally a wild card. We will um, have a kind of a standard art exhibition of, of sorts because the others are less of an art exhibition, um, but you know those have also included um, some elements from our other exhibitions. Then we have two annual exhibitions. One is the annual Black Doll Show, which I'll speak on today. 42 years. This is our 42nd year. And uh, it's really significant because it's actually the longest running annual exhibition in the city of Los Angeles. And it was something that was brought together by community members that was um, upheld and, and continued by community members. So it really speaks to the power of people that people generally deem powerless, you know, average everyday people. And um, and then uh, we have an exhibition that I started back in 20, 2009, and it's called the uh, African American Composers Series, and we're named after Dr. William Grant Still, amazing composer, really prolific composer. Um, if you haven't heard his music, I, I sure hope that you uh, look up his work. But um, it, it felt like it would behoove us to focus on on composers. Um, and uh, each year we dig into archives and bring a discography and 
artwork, whatever we can, so that we can present uh, the work of a composer. And then we have an education program, a free education program that also teaches the music of that composer uh, to beginning students. So these are students a lot of times who've never held an instrument or have never taken an art class, but we teach through the music of that composer, which is a bit more difficult than it might seem. Especially our, our our teachers, I usually get cussed out during that that season by our teachers because it is complicated to try and all of a sudden teach music out of the We Insist album of uh, Max Roach and Abby Lincoln. So um, we this exhibition that I'm talking about in particular, the annual Black Doll Show. I want to go back to that because that's really what I want to focus on right now. And we're in the middle of installing that right now, so. Um, I will be leaving around 8.30, 8.40 or so, so that I can rush over there and open the doors for everyone. But, well, everyone is small. But I did want to tell you that um, although we have had a really uh, famous uh, pedagogical program, we've had education classes, a summer camp each year, each summer for, for children, we're having to discontinue our education program because for the past six years, we've been working without sufficient staff and the city has not allowed us to hire any full-time staff. I am the only full-time person and on staff right now, I only have two part-time individuals. Um, we have teachers that check in when we have classes, but um, they generally work for an hour or two a week. Uh, when we have classes. So unfortunately, with that, it's just not sustainable. And uh, we have had to put our uh, classes on hiatus until we get sufficient staffing from the Department of Cultural Affairs. So I think at some point, I'm also going to ask for some advocacy from the group. But um, because it is a bit frustrating, you know, when our center was slated to be shut down, then we didn't see that same attempt at shutting down, but we've seen the bleeding out of our center through funding, through lack of hiring, etc. So, um, so anyway, we are continuing with this tradition because the annual Black Doll Show is very, very important, I've learned. Um, the first time I saw the um, annual Black Doll Show was in 2005 myself at the William Grant Still Arts Center. And um, I had been there before and I had uh, gone to the African Marketplace, which was initially founded by Hakim Ali, the first director of our, of our center at the William Grant Still Arts Center, and then was grown eventually by a man named James Burks and turned into an amazing uh, large outdoor marketplace. So, um, you know, all of these legendary things have happened out of this space. And um, I had not seen the legendary Black Doll show. And I did get to see it in 2005 when I first started. And um, I saw throughout the years that this, the exhibition is very much about Black dolls and the importance of Black dolls. And I'll probably get into that a bit as I'm showing you some images. But it was very much about the community coming together and making sure that certain histories are continued and that certain traditions of learning and, and sharing are continued. And that was the part that was so, I, I was so blown away by, by how an archive was kept without it being a traditional archive. And I learned that through the making of dolls, an archive of, of uh, creating humanity. Um, so uh, I'm gonna share with you uh, a few images. And um, this right here is the flyer for the fifth annual uh, Black Doll Show, which was in 1985. About um, 12 years ago, I started to pull together all of the archives of the Black Doll shows with the hopes of being able to actually put out a publication that uh, focused on the annual Black Doll show at the William Grant Still Art Center. Not just looking at dolls again, looking at a community that came together that brought this together. So I'm going to just kind of go through um, some of what we have here and show you what uh, we've done throughout the years. So the show was started by 
uh, a man and woman um, named the Fergusons. So Cecil Ferguson, some of you may have heard of, was a um, curator, uh, a very well-known curator in our community. And Cecil and his wife, Miriam, who are watching Art Link Letter one day, and while watching it, the video of the original Black Doll Test um, by Kenneth and Mamie Clark was shown. And when they saw it, um, they were just, they, they, they were so saddened and they felt like the idea of Black Dolls needs to be shared again. And they decided to, um, they, they decided to, bring back a, a, a show that was focusing on Black dolls, except the first show was literally all assemblage art. Um, and so here we have uh, a curator. This is in 2014. We did this exhibition called A League Supreme. And I'm going to start with uh, this, uh, this exhibition a little bit and, and um, let you look at what Kisa Davis on the, on the left um, she was our education coordinator and she's gone off, she grew up in the neighborhood and has gone off to start an education program at the Heidelberg in Detroit and um, it's still a strong supporter of our center and a, and a good friend, but Kisa really um, curated an extraordinary exhibit that year that I was so blown away by. And at first we, all of us kind of didn't get it. But um, I wanted to show you this because she's here um, next to Fana Babayo, who made that assemblage piece. And our very first exhibition was basically all assemblages. California, in particular Southern California, is very well known for its assemblage movement, um, most of which comes out of South Los Angeles, South Central Los Angeles. So um, this tradition was very present in our first Black Doll show. Then after that, each year, we have we have a friends group. Uh, it's not so active right now, but we've had a friends group. Uh, our friends group decided to take on the Black Doll show and do it every single year because it was so popular. So each year there were different curators and each curator took a different look at Black dolls. Sometimes they were collectible items. Sometimes they were mostly sculptures that were seeped in tradition. And other times it was mixed. It was all, all sorts of dolls, some manufactured, some were um, made by individual artists. Um, so in this year in particular, where Kisa Davis um, did this exhibition, it was called uh, A Love Supreme. And um, it, was, it was looking at gentrification through the notion of Wakanda. And this is before uh, we had the film Black Panther. Of course, the, the comic existed and Kisa being a, a, a comic nerd uh, decided to focus on the idea of Wakanda and uh, South Central being Wakanda, our art center focused behind her as the Wakandan Cultural Art Center. And this was when gentrification was really, really violent in the West Adams neighborhood. And I mean the violence, I mean that. When, when um, homes are getting broken into by ice in the middle of the night so that parents can be deported off and children left behind, when um, there are uh, all sorts of uh, actions through police violence or, or, or detention of nearly all of the black males in the neighborhood being affiliated with one or the other gang, even if they weren't, um, you know, the criminalization of, of our neighborhood and also the, the reaction of our community. We witnessed so much of that. We witnessed, um, you know, Adams was, uh, had been a strip for a very long time because it's just off of the 10. And we witnessed, um, Kisa and I used to have to go on the street and literally intervene with the trafficking of, of very young girls watching 12 year old girls put on the street um, for prostitution. And so that's what the gentrification was doing in the community. That's the kind of violence. And it has, the neighborhood has very much changed right now. And um, it is, it's very sad for us in a lot of ways, uh, having to see so many of our beautiful neighbors uh, children that I saw grow up um, have to move out, but we're still there and we still serve the people who founded the center 
and also um, we're open to of course everyone everyone who shows love but we we are very much seeped in that tradition and so I really wanted to show you share with you this image first because um, it shows our art center as this kind of utopia and um, I was I was very happy about this exhibition and very very proud of this beautiful exhibition but the idea was that yes there was this utopia uh, a place for bringing together different ideas. And as you can see, we have traditional dolls that we look at, but then we also have very non-traditional pieces. This exhibition also focused on, um, she wanted it to be about um, su jazz superheroes. So she asked all the artists to make jazz superheroes. And I loved that idea too, that jazz was going to come through and save the day. And if we look at today's music that's coming out of Los Angeles, so much brand new music that's coming out of Los Angeles, it's out of South Central LA. A lot of them are students, were students of mine at Locke. And um, there's an amazing uh, jazz movement that was founded out of Los Angeles. So in a sense, jazz could be the superheroes of, of our neighborhood as well. So um, going back to other exhibitions that we've done, um, you know, that was a really uh, amazing exhibition. I'll show you also Double Dutch, really important exhibition. Um, and this was curated by Michelle Tabu. And Michelle, I, I met Michelle as a, as a parent at our art center. And uh, she, was, she was making her handmade books for her children and homeschooling. And she was uh, uh, also uh, one of the founders of Coalition to End uh, Sheriff's Violence and worked on the initial phases of, uh, of uh, Black Lives Matter. And, was doing so much pedagogically that I was like, she has to work with us. So I tried to find ways for her to work with us. And um, she became our dance teacher. She's also a dancer. She's a designer. She's now our social media manager. And um, she curated this exhibition called Double Dutch. And it was looking at black girlhood. And each room was curated by either herself or her two children. And, um, it was really very thoughtful in terms of thinking about how children navigate through dolls. So this is an idea of dolls being a reflection of ourselves. And that's really what she focused on. Um, we have had dolls not necessarily be considered a reflection of ourselves. And, uh, you know, I may show you a couple of uh, images from uh, Salvador de Bahia, where we've um, been able to get dolls that are spiritual. So um, just so you get a sense, we we do a fully immersed exhibition installation. We paint the walls. We um, we really create a, a, a kind of feeling as you go in. And Michelle is a big fan of things hanging from, from the ceiling. Our ceiling's kind of like standard, you know, we don't have a very fancy ceiling, but, um, you know, she made do with what we had and doll artists came through and they decided that they were really gonna live up to this. And, you know, they had children playing. And um, I'm sure we have other, ex uh, other, I'm gonna, I apologize that I'm maneuvering a little bit slowly. It's, you know, I have to move the bar of our faces occasionally. Um, there we go. So here we have Pat Shivers offering a workshop. And this is another way of us presenting an archive. And I keep mentioning archives. The archives are very important to us. When I started working at the William Grant Still Art Center, I was, I had the opportunity to dig into people's personal archives. And as you know, in so many communities of color, um, people take it upon themselves to keep their own histories. And um, it, you know, we know the canons are not are not keeping this these histories. And so I dug in with a few librarian friends, and we started to do various work on finding ways to keep people's archives, to catalog them, etc. But through the Black Doll Show. 
I learned that an archive works in many ways. And so this is an archive. You know, what, what we do is we present an archive of this tradition of doll making through our workshops. They're very well attended. This is a workshop that is mostly attended. Pat's was mostly attended by adults. And we have uh, a lot of our, our very well-known doll artists at her workshop because she is such a master. She makes such beautiful dolls. So, um, you know, you see that, that it's very diverse group. And um, we generally would get very cozy in there. You know, we'd have tea, et cetera, and people would chit chat. And then there's the archive that happens through the sharing too. So what, what I wanted to share with you right now in terms of these images was that this is not just about dolls. Dolls are very important. Um, they're psychologically important, they're spiritually important, they're uh, inspirationally and artistically important. We don't see them as craft, we see them as high art at our art center, and um, we can certainly get into all of all of the uh, ideas around that. But I want to show you a couple of videos. Um, What's up, everybody? It's your friend Greg J. Hannibal, the radio. Today, I want to talk to you about quilting in the African-American tradition quilting and doll making in the African-American uh, tradition. And the reason I know that you're thinking, wow, what an obscure thought uh, just uh, from Hannibal the radio, but uh, the reason I want to bring this up today is because my mother, may she rest in peace, was quite an artisan and collector of uh, African-American dolls and quite the artisan where it came down to quilt making in the African-American tradition. And uh, she has quite a collection of, of intricate quilts. Uh, she was quite the artist and uh, we at one point submitted a lot of her work to the William Grant Still Art Center uh, in Los Angeles for their uh, Black Doll exhibit and this was one of the first times that they had also used quilts and uh, it was uh, welcomed, the exhibit was welcomed with such uh, notoriety and it was just an honor to see some of my mom's works up there with uh, all different African-American women from all around the nation who have submitted their dolls, submitted their handiwork, all handmade and some of them are collectible. So here what I want you to do is just enjoy some of the sights and sounds of the Black Doll exhibit at the William Grant Still Art Center out there in Los Angeles, California. I'm Matavelli. I'm the education coordinator here at uh, William Grant Still Art Center, and I'll show you a few things that we have up right now during the Black Dolly exhibit. It's the 27th annual, so it's been going on here for a long, long time, way before I got here. But um, we really are very proud of this show in particular because we feel like we have some amazing pieces. So I'll show you. It's not an academic show. It, we really wanted it to be more of a community setting, although you know the. Dolls are on exhibit, they're art, we explain to children that they're art, they're not, you know, huggable or touchable dolls, but we still wanted it to be very comfortable, so we don't necessarily have placards along all of them, but we do walk people through, and this set of dolls right here, the Ragnation dolls, they're uh, dolls by uh, the artist Pat Shivers, and what she wanted to do was she created these boudoir dolls that are connecting with every woman's uh, inner little girl. And some of them are kind of fashionable, some of them are very um, Afrocentric, some of them are very um, sexy, very sexy. Some of them have high heels and, you know, even if you look at some of them, they have cute little undergarments and things like that. I'll show 
show you Betty Jane's. So Betty Jane Johnson's um, quilts and dolls are amazing. We've just scattered them everywhere. Maybe this one right here, the small quilt um, that has Dr. King and Coretta on it. And what she did was, there was a technique that was started by another woman, but she picked up this technique and she got a pixelated photograph. And with this pixelated photograph, she used a patch for each pixel rather than um, just trying to do an overall mm -hmm. picture. And she created this image, this optical illusion that we see with, with oh the uh, quilt that, you know, when we squint our eyes, we can see the image. all over the place. She, when people walk in, they're just stunned by what she does because, or what she's done in her life. Because it seems like in a short span of her life, she was so prolific. I mean, she raised her children and, and grandchildren and, and uh, from there became an amazing artist. And then we have um, a few other dolls. We have one doll from about 200 years ago. It's, it's a quilt doll. And this doll right here has no face. Uh, it has no, no distinctive features, but you can see it's been really loved. And uh, it's, it's probably our oldest doll. Cynthia Davis, who works at Charles Drew. And she started out by being um, an outreach and educator that uh, basically talks to people about HIV prevention and also um, whatever to do when once someone has uh, contacted HIV. So um, we have photographs that she's taken from her trips to South and East Africa. She met a group of grandmothers that were making some dolls. They weren't really unified, but they were making some dolls. They were so amazing and so uh, museum quality that she thought it would be great to have a collective. So they started a collective, and this collective actually was making these dolls that were being sold to museums, and it was sustaining the group. And a lot of the grandmothers had children who were who were sick with with AIDS, and it was able to buy. They were able to buy meds basically and take care of their families off the money that they raised here. Unfortunately. I think it was about a year ago, um, uh, cholera swept through and all of the grandmothers have passed, all of the grandmothers that were part of this collective. And so some of the ancient art, some of the old arts of actually creating dolls, creating traditional folk art, I guess as it's called, are just dying away with, with grandmothers and they're not really being passed on. This, this collective really tries to pass it on to the youth, but a lot of youth were not really interested in, in continuing this art form. Oh, she was yellow. And she's being coquettish. You can see she's got her head down and she's uh, looking up at you from behind a little veil of gold chains. The shoes, oh, she was very sexy. These dolls right here are uh, glove dolls that were made by Cheryl Williams. They're made out of gardening gloves. And what I love about these is, when I was growing up, these gardening gloves, which we call brownies, we knew if anybody was walking around in the streets with, with brownies on, they were ready to fight. And so when I saw these symbols that I typically would see as symbols of work, hard work, or symbols of violence, and they were transformed into these beautiful little dolls, this was amazing to me. I love the concept of transformation getting something that's an ordinary object or something that has been seen by many people as something negative and turning it into positive. This was really nice. Uh, an ugly tie quilt. And she made this of her husband's uh, uh, old ties that he didn't want to Wow. Yeah. They are the nice ties though. They are nice ties. Yeah. I got them. Beautiful ties. But yeah, this is another, another way of transforming and recycling. And you see that over and over again in this show. Beautiful. People make something out of out of the things that are being thrown away or things that are being discarded and they make beauty out of out of that, make art out of it.
play this for you. Black, black, black doll magic. Doll, black doll, doll, doll magic. Doll, doll magic. Black doll magic. Magic. Why is that doll ugly? Because he, because he's black. He's black. He's black. White people didn't want to see a black child playing with a black doll. They were punished for it. So black people designed a doll that was white on one side that they played with around white people. When they were safe with their families, black children played with the side of the doll that looked most like them.
to be able to ask questions, but um, I definitely didn't, I, I talked a lot and I apologize. I should have just been quiet and shown you the dolls because as you saw, they're really fascinating and they're so beautiful. And I didn't want to stop watching it. And I've seen those videos a ton of times. So <laughs> no, great. Thank you very much. This was a very um, educational. I'm glad you went into some of the history of the of the center and um, how important it's been in um, the cultural history of Los Angeles. Um, I, I think we're going to do some questions here. So um, if you'd like to uh, ask any, you can do it one of two ways. You can go to reactions at the bottom and click on raise your hand, uh, or I will look for the analog version, the human version as well. Um, Steve, you had your hand up. You had both hands uh, up. Ami, thank you so much. This was so illuminating. I, I only had a glancing awareness uh, of what you're doing. Uh, I'll come quickly to my question. Uh, at any point, have you addressed the controversy uh, that historically some uh, doll, uh, African American dolls have perpetuated racist stereotypes uh, and images, and there have been products and Aunt Jemima and uh, other uh, cultural images and products through the years that have perpetuated uh, minstrel shows and, sure. and stereotypes. Yes, actually, we've had curators really address that. Um, we asked Miriam Ferguson to come back and curate an exhibition in, in uh, 2010, and she it was called The Politics of Imagery. And um, she really addressed that in, in that exhibition. We've addressed it in, in the past as well. Um, we've become a kind of depot where people will see on, on uh, online, uh, you know, the gollywogs and all of that being sold and they'll purchase it and give it to us so it's off the market. So we actually have, we don't put them on display too often because we mostly, I mean, we work collectively, we we decide collectively. If there's a situation that we see that we should exhibit them, we will, but because we have so many children interact, we really want it to be a celebration. We want it to be uh, something that really uh, is is about um, uh, the, the fact that, that black dolls have been so important, but the history, um, I mean, we have that too. We've definitely addressed that. And in the book, we actually um, were working on essays of it. Uh, the history of, of, uh, of uh, racist iconography and dolls is deep. And also the fact that, um, you know, I just recently, uh, our center, we worked with someone who's making a film about the first black Black Barbie, and you know, we connected them, uh, the the filmmakers, with a bunch of, um, of of our doll artists, and we talked as well. And I remember one part of the interview, they they were talking about something, and I said, "Well, you know, and black dolls being illegal." They said, "Well, where was it actually illegal?" I said, "Well, not by law necessarily, but by practice. So if someone can literally lose their life, and there will be no." no action taken towards the person that 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 killed them because they had a, a black doll then that's law you know so so we did talk about the fact that people had to hide them that's why there was such a thing as a quilt doll with no features that looked more like a quilt or a pillow than it did look like kind of represented human and um, and so we incorporate those elements too in many of our exhibitions. A lot of our curators have dug deep into that. It's super important history to to think about. I mean, I remember crossing the country um, when I was a child when we first came to the U.S. and we stopped somewhere. It was in Tennessee, and they had a, a bunch of these racist dolls. And I mean, I was I was eight years old, and I was disgusted as an eight-year-old looking at these dolls. It was actually, at, um, it wasn't a Dolly Parton's, you know, big thing. I think it was Elvis's Graceland or something. We stopped there and that's where they were selling these, these items. And, you know, as an eight-year-old, I, I was frightened and I was like, why, why would they be so mean through dolls? I just didn't really understand. But I also, you know, as, as an Iranian child, I also had to hold the little plastic um, blonde dolls growing up. So this was something that for me, thinking about um, 
The other thing is, uh, you know, the 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 stereotype of femme identity, and that's that is really challenged in this exhibition too. You know, so uh, again, that documentary is coming out about the first black Barbie. That really gets into the notions of of feminists and you know, black femme childhood and all of that too. Yeah, great. Um, Jasmine, you had your hand up as well. Thank you so much. Um, I just wanted to know like the details of when it's gonna start your uh, exhibition and um, uh, and uh, and how like the details of how, when, and you know, when you're gonna be open, you know, uh, is, is it, are you available for schools like to come and visit uh, the center? Absolutely, uh, absolutely. Yeah. This is our most popular exhibition for tours. We, um, yes, so our exhibition, we're in the process of installing it. Like I said, there's only three of us. And, um, and so it's not gonna be the elaborate exhibition. It's our first kind of Black Doll Show back to since pandemic. It's not gonna be the elaborate exhibition that you've seen in the past, but we're gonna do a, what we can. This year it's called Fun and Games, a look into ancestral mm -hmm. games. And um, we are really focusing on games and leisure. And, um, you know, in particular this year, a lot of people have been talking. I, I feel like the, the issue of, of Black men's leisure in particular is constantly a question. The same leisure that men of other races will enjoy, Black men are often criminalized for. And so we really wanted to show forms of leisure that are actually that that are criminalized, but are actually archiving histories. And um, and we do that a bit to this in this exhibition. We called on artists to uh, bring that out however they can. So we're in the process of kind of picking the colors from like Monopoly boards and dominoes and you know all this other stuff and <laughs> getting videos of people uh, playing street dice and pool, shooting pool. This exhibition will open on December 17th and our very first day we will have a doll workshop led by Dr. Cynthia Davis. Um, it's already kind of half full because we work with a woman's shelter. Um, and so we have many women from the shelter that will be coming to take that, that workshop. But, you know, it'll just be kind of a hangout and then some people will be doing the workshop and uh, and all of that. This year, we won't have a band uh, that we usually have. We usually do it up, but we just don't have the staffing, unfortunately, to be able to do that, you know, hopefully uh, soon. And then we'll be offering uh, separate uh, uh, workshops after that. Our hours are 12 to 5, Saturday through, um, through, I'm sorry, Tuesday through Saturday. However, we do open at different hours for school tours. I know that that schools need to sometimes get there before lunch or whatever. So as long as we plan it in advance, we we work it out so that we can be there. And then, you know, uh, the, the every year we pray that Gail doesn't, Gail Anderson comes and doesn't come both because we don't really have the staffing for it, but she likes me to meet her there at 5.30 in the morning. Um, but Gail Anderson usually covers it as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, um, Carol Francis, you had your hand up as well. Um, thank you so much for this. Um, you mentioned something at the beginning about calling upon us to do something. And I never really heard that as an activist group. What's with it between you and the um, LA Cultural Affairs Department? Is this periodic, depending on who's the mayor or whatever? Because first time I ever heard of the LA Cultural Center, they were sponsoring this really almost revolutionary um, Latin American event, solidarity event. And you know, uh, and, uh, what's, is it periodic and what's the situation now? Is there something that you're struggling for with them that we could be activists in supporting or what's going on with that? Sure, you know, um, it's been, uh, the, the issue is mostly the, 
office of the controller and the office of finance that want to streamline the city of Los Angeles and close down a lot of the facilities of the Department of Cultural Affairs. Um, and of course, uh, they'll talk about it as a funding issue. However, you know, as we heard leaked audio, we we heard about power plays and where uh, where they focus on. Because is it a coincidence that our center and the Watts Towers Art Center are constantly slated for being partnered out? Um, that the community that 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 it's believed that the community cannot actually manage these these uh, facilities. Our art center very much has involvement from the community, so um, the community speaks, and uh, I think that frightens a lot of people. And the truth is that when we talk mm -hmm. about when we talk about reparations, when we talk about having mm -hmm. situations where where you know there's there's justice in our communities. Um, that's done best through culture. It always has been. Our beautiful mural on the side of our wall, um, painted by the late, my good friend and the late Noni Olabisi, that depicts um, Trouble Island, a piece by Dr. William Grant Still that shows um, what happened in Haiti, the Haitian Revolution. Um, it it kind of speaks on its own. It says how the revolution was inspired and happened because of art, because of the drum. And you know you see that laid out, and uh, we strongly believe that that um, that you know there's something that frightens city officials about the community coming together. We're seeing such changes in our neighborhood, and um, and just the fact that we've been so bled dry at, at our at our art center makes me think. Well, in 2010, they tried to close us one way, and the community spoke out. So. Little by little, they just took away each year, took away a bit more, a bit more, a bit more to the point that, um, I mean, it was it was very taxing on myself and the staff, very taxing. We kept losing staff because they just, they, I mean, they could go elsewhere and get paid better, get treated better. And, and you know, of course, I, I can't do anything but encourage that because people should live there to their joy, you know, I mean, they served as long as they could and did beautiful work and um, I appreciate it. And um, I'm very honored to be there. And um, at some point I may have to move on as well because it's, it is, it's exhausting. I can imagine. Um, do we have any, um, anybody else who had their hand up? Yeah, it looks like um, Dr. Ruby and Sophia. Dr. Ruby's been waiting for a long time, I think. Yeah. If you, and Dr. Oh, Ruby, please and, go ahead. And you know what? This, I, I've been there before. I remember when it first opened. Oh, wow. And, and I'm, I'm just so happy that you're continuing the growth and the work that you're doing. And in the different shows and all the different doll collections that you're receiving, I was wondering if you're able to archive, you know, some of the ones because of the room that you have. Yeah. And um, yeah. And then yeah. You know, and then come up with different. I mean, it is just so great to see it still there. I, you know, we forget things sometimes. And um, thank you for coming to us. Uh, I'm here. I'm on the board here, and um, oh, amazing! One of the things is I I think I came with a school uh, quite a few years ago, or I'm I'm trying to think of who I did came and then came in again. You know, just walking through there, and you were kind of upstairs or something. Anyway, it was older, and then I came back, and you had grown. So it's so glad to see the new collections and just. And I think the filming that you're doing, it's great. I mean, even to get with a channel uh, to do some of your shows, you know, like you showed us. Yes. I, yeah, yeah. People come great. to us. We, I mean, yeah. we're, we're just busy plugging away and people come to us. I and mean, we've had so many entities uh, cover our Black Doll show. It's, it's really an honor. Um, yeah, thank you. And I, I'm so glad you've you've gone and visited. We do archive. Um, we get collections. We just got a major gift, a beautiful collection from uh, a woman named Sandra Campbell, who very, um, very consciously collected 
really important pieces. And we got these super important pieces. They're donated to us. So we we uh, took them in, we we cataloged them and and uh, we digitized everything, but also we're going to, they're going to be part of, of this year's exhibition. So they're definitely going to be featured in this year's exhibition. And, you know, we do our best to see what, what we can do to have our, our dolls uh, engaged in play and the fun and games, you know, engaged, engaged in the games, maybe sitting around playing spades or you know, shooting crafts, playing dominoes, whatever we can get the dolls to do. But we we play around with the exhibition too. So yeah, we we will uh, we are archiving the dolls that come through. We help artists. That's part of what we've done too. Is um, we help artists archive. Um, we help them catalog and and uh, maintain their dolls and all of that. So we've we've tried to be a source of that as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your work. And I know there's more support supporting you in your work. And this includes financially so that you continue to grow. Absolutely. Yeah. All of that. All of that. Yeah. We... There was actually uh, uh, following up on that uh, from Doc Ruby there. Uh, Steve already asked um, how we can help support funding of the center. Well, we do have a friends group still, not very active. Um, they're they're rather elderly. I'm working on um, on uh, building it back up because we have uh, you know newer people that are interested. So we're in the process of rebuilding our friends group. The friends group are, is really vital. Mm -hmm. So um, and and they take they take checks for us. That's how we do our fundraising, and they um, that's how we're you know generally if we have a reception, if our friends group doesn't have the money. It's I, I'm the one who pays for it or other staff members, you know, they'll go out and buy a couple bottles of wine and, and bring it for our receptions. Yeah. So the city doesn't fund it. They, they don't fund our receptions. They don't fund our concerts. Um, we just find ways, different ways through community to do that. So we would really, really appreciate your being involved and being in touch so that when we do need to call for things like, you know, can you help us um, with the reception? We, do, we need to get these items from Trader Joe's, <laughs> you know, that's all. <laughs> uh, that helps us or, you know, we need to really, we'd love to pay this musician. We're in the process of curating also our our, um, I think this year it's our 15th annual African-American composer series. And that one, uh, we're, we wanna bring uh, a musician from Colombia this year. And, um, you know, we'll probably need help being able to do that. And this is a mm -hmm. super important musician who's been doing Sonda Negro out of, um, uh, out of Colombia, you know, and um, really archiving the history of African music throughout the Americas. And um, and we want to make sure to be able to share that and see if there's a way that we can actually have an exchange to have our mm -hmm. musicians go to Colombia, go to, you know, the uh, beautiful maroon cities outside of Cartagena that are so powerful. I would have the opportunity to go to Palenque outside of Cartagena. Yeah. I was blown away. So, you know, to have that exchange would be really incredible. There's some amazing music coming out of Palenque. Yeah, um, yeah absolutely. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in the chat, I also put um, the link to the blog. And um, so that's one way that people can keep in touch. And um, and did there was a question about what city um, or uh, city agencies that we should be lobbying to to help support the center. Cultural affairs. Yeah, OK. Yeah. Yeah. We. Um, uh yeah, we really need help from cultural affairs. It's it's um it, that is the department, and you know they make a lot of excuses, but that's that's the department that we're under, and that's the that it's it's the general manager who calls these shots. And I think for for several years, six years, I've been asking for additional full time staff, and they keep saying, "Oh yeah, it's in next year's budget. We'll make sure." And each year it hasn't been there, and so this year it was to the point of exhaustion of myself and the staff that we just have to say no, unfortunately. We can't keep going right. um, this way. So we we were very sad. We don't like to let down our our neighborhood. We don't like to let down our community. Yeah, and I, I think we've had a, a a few years of really good programming on our forums for arts in Southern California. So maybe this will be a big help as well. Um, uh, you yeah. know, uh, us being a coalition of of artists in various mediums. Um, 
So, uh, and I know you have a uh, time constraint. So, um, I want to make sure. Yeah, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Uh, I, yeah, I, I knew yeah, you sure. had a, a question as well. Yeah, well, thank you for your presentation and all your years of work. Um, um, it's really hard to get the arts funded, uh, but the good way of looking at it is if you know your district and uh, you see development, there are developer fees, which are cash. And so that cash is supposed to be spent in your district. So that's a way to lobby the controller and saying, look, these are these fees, they're there, and the contractor has to pay them up front in order to build. So um, that's just for economic reasons to, to keep you sustained. And mm -hmm. And um, two, um, do you see yourself when you transition, which I think there has been some pushback because you're not, you know, uh, black. Um, and do you think that that has hindered some of the funding or the community support? Um, and, you know, in the arts, it's great to have allies and we love it, but it's also good uh, to have representation. And, and if you do leave, help support that transition that it it be uh, a black person running um, and even though you run it as a collective, and I understand that, but sometimes communities need the, the, the figurehead. And so I don't want to be in any way be insensitive to anything you've done and everything you've given. But I think right now, because of what's happening in L.A., that we need that, you know. Oh, absolutely. No, you're absolutely right. And that would be one of the reasons, I mean, uh, that, that I would transition out if I did. Um, you know, in terms of community support, no, we've got it. Community support is there. It's grandmas that fund everything. It's it's black women that fund and 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 do everything. That that exhibition, the Black Doll Show, has been put on for all of these years, not by the leaders that were there. They were mostly male either. It was black women that brought it together each and every year. The community still supports, is still very much involved and still very much supports. We are not talking about community. I'm talking about the, the people that try and villainize us and make excuses all the time at our art center are the leadership, especially at cultural affairs. Yes. And um, I mean, I had a I had a conversation just yesterday with the uh, with the general manager. This is someone who who um doesn't come from an arts background and has been bleeding out the community art centers, unfortunately. And, um, you know, these are decisions that that they're flowing with that come from the CAO's office. So I'm not talking about community support. We get community support. We get it strong, very strong. It shouldn't be dependent constantly on community. They are already paying taxes. Our communities are already paying taxes. The, those leaders, it, 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 is, it would behoove them to already work with the money that all of our, our folks in the neighborhood are working so hard. To, to utilize those funds, the tourism funds that are supposed to go towards communities, to have them go right back into communities. We don't, you know, I mean, I, I understand that we need to have, uh, I, I'm a fine artist. I, I think that there should be support for fine artists, but, but what's happened is that there's an institutionalizing of the arts in Los Angeles and a detachment from communities, a lack of trust that communities can actually make art. And when I talked about the, the arts that um, have come out of Los Angeles, like, like the California Assemblage movement coming right out of our community, that those came out of communities. They didn't come out of an institutionalized uh, arts kind of like leadership. It came out of communities. And that collective ideology that has come out of communities has been important. They're complex. They're not always neat and tidy. And that's the thing that's so beautiful about communities is that people will question one another. People will hold each other accountable. And that's called democracy. And, um, and I appreciate that. I like being questioned. I don't mind it at all. I, I'm I'm an Iranian woman, and I'm watching the women of Iran right now question things and and take take uh, an entire government to task, and um, I think that 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 questioning is super important, and I have to listen, I have to be present. Um, I'm not one who who believes so much in figureheads, but I do agree that the leadership at William Grant still should be um, should be representative of the people of the community. And um, right now there's three of us. So, you know, we have uh, Black, Asian, Latino, but I mean, one of each, that's just not, 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I support everything you're doing. I just think that as a, the city, the way it's been run, um, and I agree with you, we fight for those developer fees and then they'll say, well, we're going to build a museum, but our people aren't running it, you know, right. or our cultural centers. And I'm one to advocate that the funds go to the artists directly and not through a third party. And, you know, I support the arts always because it's a part of cultural preservation. So thank you for your years of service. And, you know, we have to support your center. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. And and also, you know, I do right now I've been given a short window to hire uh, part time staffing. It's called as needed staffing. It's it's like the worst way to hire people, unfortunately, yeah. because they get very little little rights and they get no benefits. Um, but during that window, I would like to hire some folks. So if, if you do know people who are interested in um, being arts associate, working on uh, helping us archive people in the community, that's very important to us. Um, we also uh, would like to hire someone who's a gallery attendant that will help kind of maintain our gallery. We actually need two people to help maintain our gallery. We need all of that. And um, we're gonna eventually need a lot more teachers if we're gonna go back into um, doing education. Another thing I should tell you before I really, oh my gosh, the people are gonna be waiting on me before I, before I run is, um, is we have, you know, uh, we do work uh, with with the council office, um, and there is another facility that's actually been kind of reserved for us. It's the old Washington Irving Library on Arlington. Oh. It's a historic building, and um, cultural affairs doesn't want to put funding into this facility. They don't want it, but there was a motion passed, and we've got it. It's there, and it's supposed to be our annex building. And when I wrote the proposal for this, um, you know, I was asked to write a proposal for us for this, I asked for it to be a space for um, for archives, and it would be basically an exhibition space, an education space, and also uh, a small repository of the archives of South Central Los Angeles. And this, the education component being really important because we have to think of new ways of archiving. And we have to look to the past to look at ways of archiving. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, disenfranchised communities, you know, I, I go back to Iran and I, and because of the research that I do uh, for my artwork, it's really based in uh, in the kind of looting and burning of the Crusades, and then and then the relabeling of of informations uh, during the Enlightenment. That I'm able to see the ways that people were able to preserve certain things without the traditional ways of pres preservation. And right now in a time when we're looking at images, when we're looking at histories, you know, we have youth that are making history. We have people in their twenties that are making history and their histories are so ephemeral and they're owned by Facebook or, you know, whatever. And um, finding ways to archive that are different by looking into our past and the various pasts of communities of colors. There's genius that exists in the ways that people have, have um, you know, figured out how, how to maintain these, these histories in the past. And we really wanna highlight that. So advocacy for, for the Washington Irving Library would be really important and making sure that that space um, is worked on, it's built and that it, comes to fruition at some point. I mean, it'll probably come to fru fruition when, you know, I'm I'm elderly and, uh, you know, hopefully living back in Iran, um, but but it should still happen. You know, it, it should still, uh, uh, you know, be there. Yeah, it's very true. And, you know, I, I think Steve put in the notes too, maybe the election of Karen Bass and in the city and, you know, can maybe be an impetus for some inshallah, change. In yeah, inshallah. So um, I do have to leave and I really yep. apologize, but um, please do share my email address and please um, call or come by. And um, I really, really appreciate this time to be able to share this, this uh, beautiful exhibition with you. And I, I hope we see you at the opening or at some point during the exhibition, please come, yep. please come. And uh, I have Jasmine's information, so I can't wait to contact you, Jasmine, and see what we can do about um, bringing you by and possibly a tour. <laughs> yep, that right, would bye, be great. Everyone. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, folks, thank you for indulging us with that shift in time, um, and, 
you know, I, I hope uh, I hope it was a fruitful talk for everybody. Um, Rick, I, thank you for bringing her to our attention for many of us. Uh, yeah. Just an illuminating program. And let's offline see if we can develop the lobbying effort to the Cultural Affairs uh, Center uh, Council that uh, we mm -hmm. find out specifically who to reach, work up a letter, get ICUJP uh, onto that. I'd like to volunteer to work with you on that because I think that's very important. Mm -hmm. uh, real quickly, because most of the people on this screen are board members and we're <laughs> having a board meeting at 935. But uh, for others, uh, remember that uh, December 16 is the holiday party, uh, two weeks from now, uh, the uh, Friday forum will be devoted to celebrating the holidays. Uh, and the board and others are organizing that with some special surprises, et cetera. And um, tremendous amount of efforts going into the Tuesday, January 11, close Guantanamo event. We have a $3,000 grant from uh, the National Religious Coalition Against Torture. We are partnering with them nationally on this event. Uh, it will be an upgraded live streaming uh, at noon California time on January 11. Uh, there'll be a subsequent uh, film version of that, all of this being produced and developed by Robert Corsini. And all of our work is supported by John Crampner, who's doing always uh, yeoman's work in organizing the speakers. Um, the uh, orange jumpsuits and hoods uh, and other elements of that program. So uh, be sure uh, if you are in town near the Federal Building downtown on January 11 to attend the event. We'd like as large a crowd in front of the downtown Federal Building as possible. And be, it will now be fully live streamed uh, in as elaborate and effective a way across the country. So those are the two big announcements today. Thank you. Um, I put in the chat all of our information about social media and the website. Uh, if you go to the website, there's a green donate button. And if you can click on that, and if you can put in... Um, uh, an amount with as many zeros as you can. No, um, if you can put in, uh, you know, uh, we're, you can make a monthly donation or you can make a, a lump donation. Uh, this past week was Giving Tuesday. So um, that's always something to remember. Um, and um, we have another thing going on um, that we're helping KPFK promote. Uh, there's a free film and webinar this Sunday at 2 p.m. And um, it uh, is Greg Pallast and Tom Hartman uh, hosting a screening of Greg's uh, film Vigilante, America's Vote Suppression Hit Hitman. And this is about the Georgia election and um, not only how um, the voting system has been rigged in that state, but how it's a blueprint for um attempts in other states as well so if you can make it um the information's right there for uh laboring through your facilitation uh, a <laughs> wonderful day uh everybody on the board uh we will reconvene at uh just a little after 9 35 to have our board meeting we'll be joined by robert corsini and john Cramner at the beginning of the board meeting for planning. Uh, we thank uh, others here uh, and we wish everybody a wonderful weekend and a week ahead. And uh, John uh, Krampner will convene in about five minutes for the board meeting. And next week we will have the um, uh, speakers from the MST, the Brazilian um, Action uh, Committee that actually helped uh, bring Lula uh, to the presidency, and they're going to talk about how that was successful uh, in the Brazilian elections last month.
So thank you all very much. Um, and if you're thank traveling, you. travel safely and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye for now. Mm -hmm. Hey, peace out.